right, it's good to see everyone that uh, we're able to make it out tonight, whether you're here or whether you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're at. We're glad that you're here and uh, just invite you to sing aloud and, and uh, praise God with this. And I'll just turn it over to Ann and we'll begin our prayer. All right, I'll make it easy for you tonight because you don't have to turn any pages at the beginning. So we're going to sing 14 and 15. So let's stand and sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. Romans 
chapter 12, again, verse 3 through verse 8. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, as one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministry. If he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. We're going to go back to when we were kids to sing some of the cool songs that I just continue to love today. So let's stand and sing 31, and then we're going to flip over to 23 and sing that with a cappella. So 31, and then to 23.
right. We have been uh, talking all of this year about the Holy Spirit, and uh, we've been jumping around, hitting a lot of different passages, and, and trying to set the tone for all of this. And from here on out, we're going to be looking at these individual texts as we usually normally do, and uh, we're going to be dealing with verse three through eight in the Book of Romans, of chapter twelve, over the next uh, couple of weeks, and then. Uh, We'll uh, go on from there, but we will be talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the distribution of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Before now, we've seen the essence of the Holy Spirit, really, and, and um, we basically were connecting theory to me or you. Or, but uh, we saw partly in a mystery and partly we have understood, but one of my favorite gifts, in fact, um, is that I've always liked getting... Uh, Gifts. Everybody like? You yeah. like giving yeah. gifts? Is it enjoyable? Yeah. Like when somebody gives you a gift? And when we talk about gifts, we usually talk about gifts. The key to these gifts, and maybe it's uh, maybe your favorite gift is a certain type of thing or a certain type of food or something like that. And uh, or maybe you like just cold hard cash. You like. Uh, the gift cards that you get to use in different places. But the key to both of these type of gifts is that a gift is from someone else. And that means that you don't have to pay for it. We're going to see that played out in how we receive gifts from God. And the second issue is that they have a certain measure of freedom to them. In that those gifts allow you, especially if you get a gift card or cash or whatever it is or a check that doesn't bounce or something like that, then, then uh, you get those things and you can use them however you want. And uh, there's a freedom to them. So, in other words, they're not yours. They're a gift from someone else. Someone else worked for it and gave it to you. Okay, does that sound biblical? And also that these have a certain amount of freedom. We're going to see those two principles laid out. Um, we're going to see the first part tonight. Next time I speak, you'll hear... In fact, of the second part, that uh, you're going to have something that is given to you that is not yours. You didn't work for it, but it is yours because it was given to you. And secondly, that you're going to have a measure of freedom with that gift once you receive it. Okay? So the same will be true when we look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit over the next several weeks. They are specific. In other words, they are sort of fixed, if you will. And it's just like a person does not choose uh, the characteristics that they have, right? You know, you didn't choose your parents, and so that means that you will receive from your parents uh, the, the, from the lineage in which you have. And you may have gotten your uh, father's eyes and your mother's nose, or, your, or you may have gotten the height and your siblings did not, or whatever it is. And uh, there was a time, in fact, in my family... Uh, passed up, I'm not sure. But there was a time in my family when I was young and before I started to shrink that, uh, in fact, I was the tallest person in my family. And I thought, well, that's that's quite a gift. But, you know, I didn't do anything to receive it. I, 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 just, I just got it. It just came to me, right? I didn't work hard to be six foot two. Now I'm six foot one and two thirds. But I didn't work for it. I simply received it, right? So... We see that in the fixed gift of the Holy Spirit. But we also see, again, a freedom to it. And again, I'm setting this tone that not only for tonight, but for the future. That uh, to be grown and expanded on and uh, to make good or bad decisions with it. In other words, if I was six foot two when I was 20 years old, then I, I, I had to do something with that, right? And uh, if I had uh, beautiful eyes when I was at, or if you had beautiful eyes or if you had beautiful hair, the question is, what are you going to do with that beautiful hair? Are you going to cut it off short? Are you going to make it long? Or are you going to cut it, comb it from the side or in the middle or all of those things? In other words, you give, you are given certain things that you had nothing to do with. But then once you have those things, you are responsible for those things, right? And so... I think we're going to find out that that's how it works with the Lord, too. Even more so, we see it with salvation. And uh, our Bible study Thursday night, one of the passages I, I pulled to that was uh, in my dining room there down at the house. 
uh, was from this passage, John chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. It says, but as many as received him, speaking of Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. We have to deal with the reading of this text. And so when we understand that, and we notice and break this down, we understand that it says in that text that he gave. In other words, God gave salvation. That's what it's speaking of. John uses the term, it is a gift from God. The same is true of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts from the Holy Spirit. You have a difference. When you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. He is a gift that God gives you. But it is also, and we're going to find that out tonight and over the next several weeks, you have certain gifts that God gives you to be used. He talks about, he uses the term, in fact, in that passage, we're not born of blood. What does that mean? It means that, in other words, it was not from your earthly parents. It's not from your earthly father. In other words, your earthly father and mother give you certain gifts physically. But what he is comparing it to, he's, in fact, that first verse is about the physical gift. And the second verse is saying that the spiritual gift is similar to the physical gift. That you were given a certain gift from your parents, but they're... In fact, all believers receive a spiritual gift from God. It says, not born of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor by man, but born of God. In other words, salvation is of God. It's not of you. It's not of man. Your mom and dad can't get it for you. If your mom and dad were great Christians, that doesn't mean you will be. It means that you're responsible for yourself just as they are. How do we walk freely in this grace? Let's talk about spiritual gifts. And uh, if I were to break this up, we're not going to get through all of it tonight. We're only going to do the first three verses. But it says that I would label verse 3 through 5, the gifts are a result of grace. We're going to talk about grace tonight. And then when I meet with you again, we'll talk about the gifts once received. Once we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then we're responsible for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're get responsible for how we decide to use those gifts. And then finally, in verse 6 through 8, he names several gifts, and we'll talk about those gifts. And maybe you have one of those gifts. But tonight, let's talk about these spiritual gifts and how they are a result of grace. In other words, uh, when we talk about gifts, and we can confuse them with something called talents. Gifts and talents are not the same thing, especially in the biblical sense. That, in fact... Uh, Talents and biblical gifts or gifts of the Holy Spirit are separate. You can have a talent, for instance, you can have a talent for playing the piano. You can have a talent for public speaking, or you can have a talent, doesn't mean you have the, the gift of teaching. You can have a talent for athleticism, and you can have a talent for this or that. But that talent is a talent, and it is also from God, but it is separate from a gift that is given through the Holy Spirit to the believers. For instance, we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy and the gift of ministry and the gift of teaching and so on. We're going to get to those. But in fact, you can have all of those. And here's the thing. All of them are gifts from God. And you say, that's not a big revelation. Actually, it is a big revelation. Because we have to understand that just as you get a characteristic from your parents, so you have been given something from God, and it's purely grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Remember, we always define grace very easily, right? G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense, right? That's how you receive it. But grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, I don't, I don't deserve it, but I have received it. Notice Paul's points here in these first three verses. Look at it with me. Let's look at it again. It says in verse 3, For I say, Paul is speaking, through the grace given to me, to everyone is among you. In other words, Paul is likening himself to as one who has received grace, and he is going to compare it to the grace. He says, if it was given to me, it will be given to you. Not to think 
of himself more highly than he ought to think. In other words, if you have a gift that is very prominent, don't think that it makes you better than someone else that doesn't have a prominent gift. But to think soberly, I like that word, as God has dealt to each one. Let's break that up into four principles here. First, Paul had a personally received grace from God. Not only had he received grace that he was saved and that he was a believer, but he says, I also uh, have received grace, and that grace doesn't make me, Paul the Apostle, any more better than you. Now, that's hard for most people to believe because the world doesn't work that way. In the world, if you have a prominent gift that allows you to stand on a stage and speak, then you consider yourself better than other people. But in the church, it does not work that way. We're going to make that point in just a moment, or Jesus is going to make that point to his disciples. We often think that if we have a prominent gift, that we then are better than others. That's how the world thinks. Jesus would say this to us tonight, but that's not how you should think. You should realize that if you have a prominent gift, it's not because you are better than other people, but it's because God saw fit to bless you with this gift. And so... Paul is saying that personally I testify of all the grace and all that has come to me. And so when he says the grace that is given to me, he is saying that God has shed his grace upon him. Now, the second principle is that grace eliminates bragging. In other words, it does not matter what gift you have, what position you have, what title you have, that you have to realize that you don't have any place to brag about it. You have no place to boast, they would say. That God's grace given to me, thus he gets all the glory. Now I want you to turn. I told you I was going to let Jesus teach us this tonight. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark. The Gospel of Mark chapter 10. And there is a conversation going on in Mark chapter 10 that uh, the disciples are having. And they think they're having it, and Jesus does not know what they're talking about. And so after they have this discussion, their little argument breaks out about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There were 12 of them, the 12 disciples, you know them, and they were having a discussion about who would sit next to Jesus and who would be considered great. And in fact, some family members even got in on it. And uh, they were all arguing who's going to be the first in command behind Jesus. Now, of course, the problem of this, and you may have picked it up, is that this is, again, not an argument that a Christian should have. And so in Mark chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 35. We're going to read all the way so we can get all the context through verse 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through verse 45. Again, I'm reading from the New King James. So... Uh, it's a little different than uh, that's the difference. All right. So verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, or Rabbi, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, that, was where, that was pretty forward, wasn't it? Can you imagine going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. <laughs> and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may set one on your right hand and one on the other on your left in glory. In other words, these two brothers came and they said, We want to dominate the power structure that you will create when you become king. That's quite a task. But Jesus said to them, because it was teaching time, Lesson time. Who knows that life is about lessons? Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. In other words, what he's going to tell them is there's a price to pay for these things. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Of course, he is talking about the suffering that he's going to be going through. They said to him, we are able. How many think that they knew what they were asking? They didn't know what they were asking. You, 
can see when it when Jesus actually goes to the cross. What does the Bible say? The disciples were scattered like a like sheep without a what? Without a shepherd. So Jesus said to them, "You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with uh, the baptism that I'm baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared." And when the ten heard it, in other words, the other ten disciples, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. They may have been saying, why didn't we think about this first? But Jesus called them to himself and said to, him, said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall become a what? Servant. Say that again. Servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now that is a very different outlook on greatness, isn't it? The world looks at greatness in a very different way. And so what Jesus is doing there is teaching James and John and the disciples and us exactly what Paul is speaking of when he speaks about being given the gifts of the Spirit. If you have a gift that is prominent, that is seen, that is easily seen, it doesn't mean anything except that God gave it to you. And if he chose not to give it to you, then they, you wouldn't have it. And so it leaves no room for, as we said, what? Bragging. There's no room for bragging. You say, oh, how great Billy Graham was. No, God was great through Billy Graham. And God did not have to give it to Billy Graham. He could have got, gave it, given it to whoever, right? But we are grateful. We are grateful. That God gave it to Billy Graham because we were all blessed through it. And that is the point of these spiritual gifts. Paul had personally received this grace. Paul the apostle had received it not because he was worthy of it, but because God saw fit to give it to him. Grace eliminates all the bragging. The third principle, when we understand grace as God's unmerited favor and the gifts of the Spirit, is that we should think graciously. That word a while ago that I told you I like so much, the word soberly. When we think soberly, we are not like the person who gets drunk and, and makes grandiose claims and does all kinds of ridiculous things, right? An alcoholic may come and say all kinds of things. And they don't mean it. And some of it is rude and crude, and some of it is just, again, grandiose. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And then they become sober and realize that I can't do this or that. But he says that you don't even have to drink alcohol to act like someone who is out of their mind. In fact, there are men and women, boys and girls every day who get up in this country, in this world, and they go out and they make all kinds of promises that they cannot make. What does Jesus say about promises? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else is from the evil one. In other words, just... It'll be good enough if you can keep your promises today, <laughs> because that is difficult in and of itself. In other words, be humble. Be humble. Live in humility. It is, in fact, told us by the Roman historians who would later become uh, Christians as Christianity spread that humility is now a virtue. But before Christianity had taken over the Mediterranean world and Europe, that, in fact, humility was not looked upon as a virtue. That in fact everyone went around and they wanted you to know exactly how great they were. Even if they weren't that great. But when Christianity began to be spread within the hearts of the man, we found out that humility in fact is something that we should practice. Think graciously. Paul had personally received grace just like you and I. Grace eliminates all bragging, so let's get rid of it. Think graciously in sobriety so that we can be humble of ourselves. The final principle under God's grace being unmerited favor through the 
gifts of the Holy Spirit is that God gives grace to us with purpose. In other words, God gives this grace. He gives these gifts of the Holy Spirit with an emphasis behind it. Thus, God has dealt with each of us. Notice that phrase. He has dealt, God has dealt with each one of us individually because he knows that it should fit together just like a puzzle should fit together. I told you before, one of the things that we do, especially on vacation, in fact, especially if we go with Ann's family like we did this last summer, we went down to, to uh, East Tennessee and we went up into the mountains and one of the things they always do is buy two or three new puzzles and they set them out on the desk and people just come in and you could have come in this morning and you could have put a piece of that puzzle together and then you take off and you go out and you go for a hike in the mountains or you go down to Dollywood or whatever you would do and then you could come back six, seven hours later and guess what? That puzzle is still waiting on the table. Somebody else may have filled in a piece of it for you and you get back and say, wow, a lot of the puzzle's been done. And so you will get you a, a drink of uh, Diet Coke or whatever it is and you sit down and you start working again on the puzzle that you were working on this morning. You start putting what? The picture together. And finally, maybe by the end of that night, the entire picture is put together. You know what we do then? Pull out another puzzle. And we start putting that together again. In fact, I think, don't we have, we have a picture that we have had framed, and I think your mom and dad may have done it, had it glazed of a, what kind of dog is it? Golden Retriever with a green apple. <laughs> and I think we put that together on one of those times. It's amazing. What happened? You had about 35 people that came together and put together an entire picture. Everyone doing their little part. Some did more than others, but all did something. That's the picture that Paul wants to paint for us of the church. The church is a group of people in one setting or settings around the world, but not even that. It's bigger than that. Yes, there are Millions and millions of people all around the world and country from country right now who, in fact, are believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's amazing, isn't it? You know what's more amazing? It transcends the generation. It means that there are Christians that date back all the way, believers who date back all the way to the beginning of time, that you and I are in the family of of God. So was Moses. So was Noah. So was King David. And so was Brother Michael. You are counted in that number. Number. Isn't that amazing? And that's the idea that he's trying to bring across. That we should understand that. That no matter what gift or talent we have, use it all for the God's glory. Amen? Amen. One of my Sunday school classes I've told you about before, and it was a large, we had large Sunday school classes and we had small Sunday school classes, and uh, some of the classes were as big as churches. And uh, this one class, it was, uh, I'd say one of my three or four biggest classes in it, and uh, one of the classes had about 30 or 40 people in it. Dave Kahn was his name. He was the Sunday school teacher. He and his, his wife did that Sunday school, and they had about... 30 or 40 people in the Sunday school class, and I told you about how they would go downtown to U of L Hospital and they would get rocking chairs and they would rock crack babies. Those mothers who were hooked on crack and they had children while crack was inside of their body. And of course, if whatever the mother takes in, the baby has as well. But I had some smaller classes who couldn't do quite that much. And that's okay. Because we all, again, just like the puzzle, we all put it together, don't we? There was a couple of ladies. In fact, there was about four or five ladies. That was the size of the class. Four or five ladies who couldn't do that, but they found out that every one of them had a gift that God had given them, a talent that God had given them. And that was they loved to sit in rocking chairs, not rocking crack babies, but as they rocked, they would sit in a circle and they would do their Bible study. And when they got done, they began to knit and quilt 
and put these things together. And so what they did is they got together with the big Sunday school class, and whenever they would go down to rock the babies, because the babies needed to feel the human touch and their mother couldn't do it. So they were surrogate mothers and fathers for those babies. But when they would do it, they would take these beautiful quilts that this smaller Sunday school class had made, and I mean they were busy making those wonderful quilts that when they gave the babies back to the nurses, they would give them quilts, and whenever they were good at well enough that they could take those babies home, guess what they got to take with them? A quilt. A quilt. That's right. It's amazing. What a beautiful picture of what the church is supposed to be. <laughs> it's what the church is supposed to be, isn't it? All people coming together with different gifts and talents that God has produced within us that we may in fact do all for the what? For the glory of God and for the betterment of brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, that's what Jesus meant when he said what? You, church, are the salt of the earth. Go be salt. Let's stand and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, allowing us to be whatever it is that you have called us to be. That, Father, we were born once because our mom and dad got together and said, let's have kids. We were born again because the Heavenly Father, who made all of creation, made us born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And unless we are born again, Jesus said, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so, Father, you have given us a new life, and with that new life, you tell us to take our gifts and our talents and, and use them for the glory of God and for the betterment of our fellow man. Father, I pray that will be true for us. That, Father, we will make a difference with the time we have and with the gifts we got. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 300. 300.
Yeah, she was excited. She was excited yesterday. I went by and saw her, and they had just brought her tomato soup, and she was excited as can be. That any we should all be so excited for tomato soup. Uh, yeah. was excited. <laughs> all right, but uh, be in prayer for all of them. Again, we do have our uh, Saturday service, Brother Scott, Mr. and Sister Teresa, over there, and uh, Miss Mary on the drums. I mean the piano. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're so, so glad we could do that. We're so glad we could do that. All right, let's end uh, in a word of prayer in just a moment. Uh, remember, we're going to have a moment in which we will uh, let everybody exit, the wishes to exit, and then we're going to have a business meeting about five minutes afterwards, okay? All right, let's end in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed to it all. Brother Allen, you dismiss Lord, first we want to thank you for this day. and giving us the opportunity to come out and just serve you one more time, Lord. We, 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 we thank you for your love, your guidance, directions, and just all that you've done for us on a daily basis, Father. Just give us the spirit, Lord, that we can take of what we learn here tonight and share it with our friends, neighbors, neighbors, family, and anybody we meet, Lord. Just guide us and give us that spirit. Father, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.